uh, secure. And that song is magnificent. I got touched by her. Uh, that he hears me and he knows my name. He knows who I am. Yeah. I'll give you my life, God, but I can't do this without you. And I think that's the that's the thing that you know we got to have. I was laughing because um, to myself I think about all these little stories that you know come up in my mind over the years as we have made all of these shifts. And and I told you that I've been at the church that I've pastor. I've been there for 30 years. And I, I'm just saying this now again to pastors who are either beginning or if you begin to initiate change, here's what you're going to realize, that it takes three to five years to complete a movement or a, a shift. It takes three to five years to, you have a vision for, okay, here's what we're going to do to, right, and, uh, and then, and you think, oh, we're going to do that, and you know, by next week everybody's going to be jumping up and down. No, uh, it'll take you at least three years of preaching these things over and over again so that they become embedded in, in people's minds and in your own heart. It becomes, it reestablishes so much the, that, you know, I can preach about the redemptive purposes of God now as if I own it, but I didn't always own it. You know, at one point, it was just what I aspired to. Like, I want to be that guy who owns it. And it took years of preaching and reaching and trying and struggling. And you hear Pastor Pete say the same thing. You know, for years, you know, I wandered here, and then, you know, God showed up, and I saw something. You know, but it was all about the movement. It was all about the journey. It was all about the walk. And uh, I don't know, Pete, if you heard this in, uh, in Hebrew with the Hebrew guys, but... It's been said to me that the Hebrews never thought of themselves, or the Israelites never thought of themselves as having a religion. They thought of themselves having an identity and a walk, a way of, way of living, a life, yeah. And so even, and I'm going to probably botch this up, but Pete will help me. You have the Haggadah, which is the walk, isn't it? That's what it's called, the Halakha. Halakha is the walk, and the Haggadah is the rules. You got the rules and you got the walk. Rules and walk. And so when Paul says, if you have the Spirit or if you're led by the Spirit or if you have the Spirit, then keep in step with the Spirit. That means the walk. And so uh, we don't follow the Old Testament, but the Old Testament comes into the New Testament, right? And gives us information about what that's all about. And so for Paul, the walk was continue to walk the walk, not follow the rules, but walk the walk. And the rules are no longer these things out there. The rule is the Spirit who writes God's commandments on our heart so that we know them. And so uh, I, I just encourage you to, to let these things penetrate and begin to pursue them knowing that you're going to have to be patient and it's not going to happen overnight. But it has to start somewhere, right? When I first went to, when, when I first went to our church in, in, in Philly, Ohio, it's a very prosperous town, and it's, a, you know, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. It's got just a lot of good stuff in it. It's a beautiful place, and the church wasn't growing. And I laid on the floor, and I cried to God, and I said, God, you know, why, why are other people growing, and we're not growing? And why are other people succeeding, and we're not succeeding? And I thought I went into this knowing the meaning. God, God, where are you? And he said, Dutch, I'm changing you. I'm changing you first. Then you'll be successful. <laughs> I said, how long, oh God, <laughs> with this thing? And he said, as long as it takes you to be obedient. And I said, okay. <coughs> I want to continue with these uh, uh, practices only to the extent that you can see them. These practices only were vulnerable relationships, sexual purity, is something that I understand that here in the Philippines you probably don't talk a lot about. It's very awkward anywhere you go, talk about sex, talk about purity. Sexual purity is a huge piece of the Bible. Uh, what we, what we, uh, ha how we have taught it uh, probably is inadequate for this sexually charged 
world that we live in. I told you yesterday how the young people, 12, 10, 8, 8 years old, 8 year old boys, downloading hardcore pornography on their phone, right? When I was a boy, we, Pete and I were talking about this, you know, hey, look, boys are boys, you know, you know, we're, we're just boys, we got fire hoses of, 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 of uh, what do you call those things, uh, hormones, we got all kinds of stuff going through, you, you take a 15-year-old boy, he can't even think clear when, when he's sitting next to a girl. Are you guys still that old that you don't remember these things? Well, the boys in the back are smiling. <laughs> you, said, you take a 15-year-old boy and send him next to his girlfriend, and you say, now concentrate on the sermon. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> right? There are just so many things that I remember a guy said one time, see if you can, see if you can get this joke. He said, the biggest hypocrites in the church are the two lovers in the back row singing, all that thrills my heart is Jesus. <laughs> Biggest hypocrites in the church. What the church has done is to just walk away from those moments. And I realize it's awkward. But what you have to realize, even as a mother or father or grandparent, and I'm just speaking to you now, just you got you got to hear you hear, you hear a guy from the United States and look, you know you don't have to look at it after a while. But, um, these kids are are being introduced to sexually charged content so young, so young. You know, I remember uh, my eight-year-old granddaughter. She, we were watching something on TV and it was just enough off for me that I said, you know, go stop it. And she looked at me and she said, oh, Grandpa, I already know all about that. <laughs> Eight years old. So then what did our Grandpa say? Uh, tell me what you know about that. Tell me about what you know about that because you probably don't know the right stuff. Let me tell you the right stuff. Tell me about how that fits into your faith. Let me tell you how that, that translates. And uh, you've heard me say this before, and I say it again. Most of the young people in your congregation are thinking it's just sex. I hear that over and over and over again. The youth leaders will come to me and they say, we were talking about sex, and, you know, and the kids in the class were, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old kids, and they say, yeah, but it's just sex. And I'm just reminding you, as pastors and theological students, and the Bible <laughs> is so penetratingly clear that it is not just sex. That it is a relationship of intimacy between a husband and a wife that if violated breaks community. And, and if violated, breaks the presence of God, and if violated, leaves scars and wounds. And I say to, to our kids, I say, listen, you know, you come to me having multiple sexual partners, and finally after you're 25 or 28 years old, you come to me and you say, Pastor, will you marry me and this guy that I finally landed with? Right? And I've had 10 sexual partners before him, and he's had at least 10 or maybe 20 before him, me. And we're going to come before you at an altar, and you're going to perform a ceremony that's going to tie a Holy Spirit knot around us that the Bible says, let no man separate. And so I say to them, just quite frankly, and I say it at the pulpit, and I know I make it all the ones who are sexually active, <laughs> But I say, listen, when you have sex with another person, some of your identity is transferred. Some of your holy peace of God is destroyed. There is now an attachment on you from a demon. You carry that attachment from them to you. 
And so you say, you know, now I'm finally, after Ken Parker is going to commit myself to one man or one woman. And the reality is that while you may go through the ceremony, you're going to take every partner that you've ever slept with into the marriage bed with you for years. And you wonder why your sexual relationship is inadequate or impotent or... And women, young women, these boys, 12 years old, getting connected with pornography, and their minds are, de are, are completely uh, deceived to think this is what a woman looks like, and the only thing they have to see is some Hollywood-style person who's been, you know, all the blemishes have been removed, and there's some kind of, you know, fantasy sexual, you know, activity going on, and this boy now marries this girl and thinks that somehow that's what it's supposed to look like. But it's a fantasy world. Is this too strong? Too much? You okay with me? It's okay. All right. And so here's this young girl, virgin, 21 years old, marries this boy who's now been watching pornography for 20 years, 15 years, and, and, and he comes to the bedroom with an expectation of a porn star, and here's this innocent 21-year-old girl who's never had sex with anyone. You tell me how that relationship is supposed to work. And the young girl comes crying to me and says, what in the world? So okay. Hey, boy, come sit down. You need to repent. You need to start over. You need to be delivered of this demonic. And you know what? Here's the thing. They continue that addiction even after they're married. So it's much easier for them to watch pornography and have a sexual expression than it is to even have sex with their wife. Just saying. And that's the people, that's the young people that you're reaching. And you have to talk, and they want you to talk. They want you to talk to them about it. So when someone ever says to me, it's just sex, they know, oh man, you just got grandpa pastor all worked up. Because we're going to have a conversation about this. And then I say, okay, now look, here's an innocent young man who's kept himself a virgin until marriage, and then here's this innocent young girl who's kept herself as a virgin until marriage. And they come to me and they say, Pastor, will you tie a knot around us with the Spirit of God that no man could ever break? And I say, baby, that's my job. Amen. That's what I do here. That's what I do here. I'll tie a knot around you so much that the demons of hell cannot break through if you believe and you'll hold on. You see this, Pastor. And you perform that wedding and you see them looking into their eyes with the expectation of curiosity and exploration and, and love and what satisfaction and pleasure and intimacy and joy that they waited before. And that's why Paul says, this isn't, this isn't just about sex and marriage. This is about the church and Christ. And if you don't see that Ephesians chapter 5, if you're wondering where that is, this is not just about sex and marriage. This is about the church and Jesus Christ, our bridegroom, who we have been waiting expectantly to have a familiar, what What do you say, you know, a relationship with him that now is fulfilled. I don't want to make it too sexy. I just want to tell you that it's there. Right? We're nervous about sex. The Hebrews weren't nervous about sex. The old, the church wasn't nervous of us. Sex was everywhere. It just had its place. And our young people don't know that place. And so you even hear it right now, the average age, when I was, I, I don't know how old you were when you were married. I was 19 years old. I was 20, I'm sorry, I was 20 years old when I got married. My wife was 19. We had a child one year later. We've been married for 44 years. Now, when someone comes to me and says, I want to get married, you know what the average age is? No, 29. 29, I think, is the United States average age for getting married. You know why? 
because they've already had sex and they've already been living together. And they don't want to commit until they figured it out. I was telling Pete this the other day, and I know I'm talking too much about sex, but you know, I might as well while I'm on it. Statistically, the most satisfying, uh, pe the people who are most sexually satisfied in the United States, when they do a poll, everyone say, okay, everybody who's had all kinds of partners, you've had all kinds of sexual exploits, whatever it may be, and you take all of these people and you say, who are the most sexually satisfied people on the face of the earth? You know who it is? People who have only been married to one person for their whole life and only had one sexual partner for their whole life. Because sex is just like drugs. And this is absolutely true. There are endorphins in your mind that God caused to be released when you have a sexual orgasm or some kind of expression, right? And those endorphins in your mind, when you have your first expression, that endorphin is the strongest. And so when you're with the same woman or the same man for the rest of your life, that is a familiar relationship. But if you have multiple sexual partners, every time you have sex, that endorphin in your brain becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. So it's like when you talk to heroin addicts, they'll say, you know, I remember that first time I got high and I was in heaven. And then the rest of their life, the addiction is trying to reproduce that high that they can never achieve. Because once the, what would you call it, once the match is lit, you, you can't relight it. It's boom, and then that's it. And so when you say to a couple, just think of this, you say to a couple, hold your passion until you get married. And have that match light on your honeymoon or your first night or whatever it is. Have that match light then. And so their memory and everything is exclusively now oriented to this one person, not multiple expressions. And it strengthens their relationship together, not only in their intimacy, but in their capacity to live with one another and to love one another and to share life with one another, to become one, as, as uh, the Bible says, become one flesh, right? So I'm just saying there's a lot to this sexual purity and it's not about just don't do it, right? Don't do that, <laughs> stop that, right? Be a good girl, be a good boy. That's not enough today. You have to explain it to them. And if you don't know, and I'm just giving you some hints, go read up on it. Because everything in science backs up the Bible. Yeah. Everything in our, in, our, in our humanity backs up the biblical. As a fact, here's what you should be thinking. Here are these seven you know, practices that Jesus did, and we can see them. And if you see more, that's fine. I don't care. You don't have to use these. I'm trying to help you to see that there are things that we should be focusing on. But when you talk about biblical obedience, you need to frame biblical obedience not as don't do, right? Don't do that, but do this. You have to reframe it so that it's a positive, not a negative. So when you're preaching, you 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 say, you know, okay, this, right? You do that, you're going to get hurt. Do this, and you receive blessings from God. Wait, God will bless you. Do this, God wants to pour out on you. Do this, God wants you to prosper. Do this, God wants to. So you talk about generosity, and you say, you know, give everything to God, and everybody goes, oh, God, that's all they ever talk about is money at the church. And, oh, my word, you know, I've given everything I've got, and they still money sucking leeches of the church, trying to get my dollars. And, oh, my word, you know, how much more money do they want? There's an economy of God that you're tapping into when you give that you are now not in man's economy, but you're in God's economy, right? I say to my congregation, I left the best paying job I ever had. I was the president of a company for 13 years. If I were to stay there with my brothers, my brothers are multi-millionaires, and here I am trying to figure out how I'm going to have enough money to fly to the Philippines. 
But listen, here's what I say to that. God is taking me care of me better than I could have ever taken care of myself. So what do you say? Oh, you know, come to Jesus and he'll, he'll, you know, he'll take everything you got. <laughs> It'll cost you everything. But he gives you everything more than you could have ever hoped or expect. And if you live in the economy of poverty and the idea of this world, when you step into the economy of God, he, he takes care of you. He promised to take care of you. Trust me, I'll take care of you. And if you haven't experienced that economy, what you need to do more than likely is to, A, get your own head around it and begin to be generous. I, I, you know, okay, so this is a Baptist church. I'm sure you teach on tithing. You have everybody teach on tithing? Yes. Yeah, okay, so tithing, you know, I'm okay with tithing. You know, tithing to me is the worst thing that anyone ever talked about. <laughs> right? It's got nothing to do with generosity in the United States of America. Let's put it that way. I've got people in my congregation who say like this, okay, brother, I just, I, okay, let me tell you this story. I'm in a board meeting, I'm 27 years old, the church is, 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 is really, the church that I was in, it was like they were having problems, financial problems. A board member comes in and says, pray for me, I'm going to go play the lottery. says, if I win, I want you to hear this, the lottery, if I win the $10 million in the lottery, I'll tithe it to the church. Well, you know me, I'm 27. I used to be more goofy than I am now. I said, I said, brother, I'll pray for you, but only if you give us all 10 million. <laughs> and he looked at me like I was from outer space. He's like, what? People think, okay, so Pete said it just the other day, yesterday. We don't live in the Old Testament anymore. We have patterns. We have disciplines. I love the discipline of tithing. I do. I think it's great. I practice it. But I had people, I had people in my church when I went there, they make they make eight hundred and sixty eight dollars, let's say, in a month, just to use a number. Eight hundred and sixty eight dollars in a month, net. That's after taxes. You ever hear that one? You tie them the gross or the net. You ever hear that one? Yes. Okay. So he makes eight hundred and sixty eight dollars net, and I get a check <laughs> in the mail. $86.80. Makes $868. He sends me a tenth. $86.80. Now I was young and foolish because they left the church. But I wrote him back. I put the check back in the envelope and I put a little sticky note on it and I said, Thanks for the tithe, but I would suggest that if you're going to give to the church and be generous, you should at least round up. <laughs> so instead of $86.87 at 80 cents, make it 87 at least. Give me the 20 cents. <laughs> and if you really want to if you really want to be generous, round it up to $90, for goodness sakes. But you know, the church is made up of cheap skates like that everywhere. Huh? Cheap skates. They just all, you know, what's the minimum amount that I can give and still, you know, not go to hell? And that's how we live. I'm not talking to you, Baptists. I'm talking to us AG guys, too. Everybody, they, you know, you say to somebody, you say, you know, you, you need to be generous. Listen, that, it, it, it happens all the time. I mean, you, you say, I mean, I preach this over Sacrificial. So that's why I put sacrificial in there. Because I say like this, if it doesn't hurt, you've not been generous yet. 
If it doesn't hurt you, if you don't bleed a little bit, you don't have to bleed to death, but if you don't bleed, you haven't been sacrificial yet. You're not generational. You're not generational. Right? You, you give, you're making a million dollars a year and you're giving me a hundred thousand? I got people here who are making fifty dollars a month and they're giving me twenty dollars a month in gifts. And you think you're running the church here because you have that much hundred thousand dollars floating around in my, in my uh, treasury? Forget it. I could come to your church and preach these sermons for you, and then you could just say, well, yeah, that's good. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, my God, that's so good. All right, so uh, give, me the, uh, give me the next one, Johnny. If you, Johnny, could, or somebody, who's got the next slide? Is it here? Okay, so now what I want to give you is, uh, is uh, are you okay? Yes. Okay, stand up just for a second. We're going to go until 11 o'clock. Pastor Galatia was so kind and said I could go to 11. Stand up just for a second. Right? Just stand up for a second. Did you ever do this? Did you ever do this? I know you're a Baptist. You probably never did this. We weren't supposed to go to the, we were never supposed to go to the roller skating ring. Do you have roller skating here? No. 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 It would, it, it, we couldn't go roller skating because they were they would smoke cigarettes and they would dance. Ah. And so, but I like to sneak to the roller skating ring. And we did this. Did you ever do the, the, the chicken dance? <laughs> okay, so look at this guy. He's like, he's like, oh my God. I give you credit, man. Everybody else was doing it. You stood there, but not a chance. <laughs> so, so we grew up. You know, we all grew up with these rules and things, and and uh, uh, totally understand it. And you know, honestly, when I think about my great grandparents, my great grandfather was a Pentecostal preacher who came out of the coal mines of West Virginia, and he he traveled all over the Midwest, just starting little churches, never had two nickels to rub together, but had wonderful presence of God, and he had one sermon, he could only preach one sermon, he started Genesis and ended up in Revelation, and it took him about 45 minutes to get from one end to the other, and it was the most boring thing I ever heard in all my life, but he loved God, and uh, we grew up with that. And they, they grew up in, a, in a, an environment where to be godly meant to get things thrown at you, to be persecuted. My grandmother used to tell me stories about how people would throw rocks in the windows and, you know, urinate all over things. And, and uh, but she also tells me the stories of magnificent healings. And, her mother raised, you know, pray for a person who died in the street and they were raised from the dead. And, you know, you just think about those things. And the reason why they set these boundaries, these holiness boundaries, was because they made a difference. But then all of a sudden they become rules that, you know, you think that somehow not doing them make you holy. And, and it's not the things that you don't do that make you holy. It's the things that you do that make you holy. I'm going to say that again. So it's not the things that you don't do that make you holy, it's the things that you do that make you holy. Love, when you love other people, the holiness of God flows through you. You say, well, I don't do this and I don't do that. I'm a good girl like Brenda. That doesn't make you holy. That just makes you isolated. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, have, you don't have any friends, right? You're a holy girl. And, uh, and, and because people don't, I mean, you just, you, you think, you think somehow that you are, you know, better. You don't have much fun. And so, uh, that's great. Okay. So, now, here's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to start with, because I have a little bit of time, and we've got tomorrow, I've got two sessions again. And this is going to dovetail with Pastor Pete, and what he's going to teach. But I want to start with this 
story. And I think you'll see why I want to use this story. I think you will. I'll try to, I'll try to make it as connected. I'm going to talk about, here's what I want to talk about. And I know, I know you're Baptist. And I know I'm a Pentecostal. And I, know, and I know sometimes language can be a barrier. I don't want it to be a barrier. I want you to hear what I'm saying because this is not a Baptist Pentecostal thing. This is a Bible thing. Okay? And how you do it and how you give expression to it, I'm, I'm taking my hands off all of that. I just want you to see what you have to be able to do as a Christian. And that is, if you're not going to like the word, maybe, I don't know, maybe you will, but you're going to have to pray with prophetic authority over people. Now, I want to, I'm going to pause there. I'm just going to stop, and I know. I just want you to digest that. I'm not telling you to be an Old Testament prophet. I'm not telling you to read people's mail. I'm not telling you any of those things. I'm not saying, you know, I thought prophet in no way, you know, you know, that kind of thing. That's crazy business. And I agree, some of it is just crazy business. But the Bible says that we should have an answer for our faith. And if our answer is what God says about things, then what I'm telling you is that's prophetic. So if God says, love one another, that's Jesus being prophetic because prophetic is about the future coming to us. Follow my teaching so far? Yes. So the kingdom of God is here, but not yet. It's in the future and we're reaching for it. We're being prepared for it. And when we prophesy, we're declaring the future now. I'm going to say it again. So that when we prophesy, we're declaring what God says in heaven on earth. I'm going to say it again. So if I'm going to speak with prophetic authority, I'm going to declare with power and authority what God says is right and true in the heavenly realms of the future that are coming to us. What God says in the heavenlies, I'm going to declare now in this moment prophetically. So I could say to Pastor Bitz, I used to do this one with my congregation, and I think it's a good one. And it's so vague. Okay, so it's so vague. Anybody can do this. Yeah. I see you in the future. And you look better than you look right now. Amen. Amen. Now, Pastor Bitz is going to say, well, how much better do I look? <laughs> well, how do you know I look better? <laughs> what do I look like? Okay, so now that's a whole other thing. Right? But you can begin, and you have to. You, I mean, if you walk, look at, if you walk into the darkness, and you don't have a prophetic word to speak, what are you going to share? So you walk up to some prostitute who's, you know, what, selling herself, right, and to, to continue to, to to violate her body with drugs and alcohol and whatever might have perversions that are there, and you, and she looks at you and she says, "Are you a man of God?" Or you a woman of God? And you go, yes, I am. She says, speak to me. What are you going to say? You, you think you want to say no words? You don't want to, say, you don't want to rely on your words. You want, to, you want something that's true and real and from God. And you can say to the young prostitute, you can say, I see you in the future. In God's future. And you look better than you look right now. That's easy, isn't it? I mean, that's not, I mean, you can grasp that, correct? Yes. Yeah. So I'm not asking you to go into a trance or become a charismatic or anything like that. I'm just saying you have to be able, that's what I tell my people. You remember, most of my people, I say most, two-thirds of the people who come to my church are not charismatics. They're Baptists, they're Presbyterians, many Roman Catholics, all kinds of people come to my church. They're all welcome. I say, come on in, come on in. But I teach them. 
not the Pentecostal stuff. I teach them the Bible stuff. I teach them the power stuff, like what you need to function. And these competencies that you see on the screen, which I'll cover them, and I'll do more tomorrow, but those competencies you have to have and you need to teach, because if you don't, your people will be ill-equipped. They will, they'll have the knowledge and, and things, but they won't have the understanding to put it into action. So I'm gonna talk about this prophetic declaration. So my daughter, I told you a little bit about her. She's 42 years old. She had two kids. I have two grandchildren, a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old. And they're wonderful kids. They both, during COVID, they started a business uh, making masks. I know a lot of times people were absolutely anti-mask. But, you know, in the, in the state that she lives, in Michigan, they require masks for everything. And so my granddaughter, who's 14 years old, said, I'm going to make masks and sell them and with the profits, I'm going to give to this missionary effort in India where my great, great, her great, great, great grandfather, parents, uh, started an orphanage. And they had this thing called Project Rescue, which was rescuing these trafficked girls in, uh, in India, Pakistan and India. And so that, the, the missionaries had come to the church where they attend and talked about this mission, and my granddaughter was touched, and she said, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm 14 years old, and I can do something about it. So in her basement, they bought her, actually, we, we gave her my wife's sewing machine. They ended up buying more sewing machines, but they started making masks, and people started buying them, and she was pretty reasonable in her price, but she only kept enough just to keep buying more material, and, and she gave over $10,000 when all said is done to this mission. 14 years old. You tell me about flourishing now. I want to tell you about flourishing. She said, I'm going to do something for Jesus. And Jesus said, okay, I'll help you. So in the midst of this, she's watching TV. And the governor of Michigan goes to the platform, to the podium on you know, national news. And she's a hard line Democrat. Very liberal. Most Christians don't like her, right? All that thing. My granddaughter looked at her and said, God loves her. And she says, uh, she's wearing this, uh, some of you ladies might know what I'm talking about, about a herringbone jacket. Very sharp, very classy looking herringbone jacket. My granddaughter says, I have material in my little thing here that I can make her a mask that's a herringbone mask that will match her jacket. So she makes this mask, she sends it to the governor, the governor puts the mask, and the next thing we see, we see the governor, everywhere the governor is, she's wearing my granddaughter's mask. And she's telling everyone about my granddaughter who's making these masks for this homeless project, or this project rescue in India. The governor of Michigan is saying this, right? And she's not a Christian, She's got some faith, maybe she's born a Catholic, I don't know what she is, right? But she, she's calling my granddaughter on the phone to talk to her, and she says, will you do a, will you do a FaceTime with me where we can work together to show me how to make a mask? The, the staff from the governor's office was calling my granddaughter, my, my, my daughter, and saying, we're so impressed. Here's one conversation. This woman, now listen to me, I know this is strange to you, but this woman was a lesbian, had left the faith. Maybe she was a good Baptist. And she, maybe, right? Or maybe a good Assembly of God. I don't know what she was. But she said, when I grew up, she says, I was in the church. I was taught all this stuff. But she says, I wandered away and I became a lesbian. And she's talking to my daughter with tears. Tears. And she's the right-hand person. She's like the lieutenant to the governor. And tears. And she says, you know, your daughter's faith and love to, to do this, she said, has challenged my faith and I'm thinking about my faith all over again. It's not what you don't do, it's what you do. So of course, my daughter has to start thinking, what am I going to prophetically declare in this conversation? So she, not quite sure, we have the conversation. I had the conversation and she said, Dad, what do I do? I said, I said, baby, you're going to have to think, you're going to have to come up with some ways of expression so that you can begin to prepare their soul 
declare over them what God wants for their life. Start to begin to declare it. And so, you, you know, you've got to practice this, is what I'm saying. You know, it doesn't come natural, right? You've got to practice it. So about two years ago, she was in New York City. My daughter sells property, or, uh, yeah, property and, and uh, conferences for Marriott Corporation. She's the number four seller internationally. She just sold the biggest job Marriott ever sold. The president of Marriott called her and said, congratulations, you're the top seller. She's all happy, right? Puts her in a different room, puts her in another room of people. So she's sitting in, the, in this conference in New York City. One of her peers comes. He's a flaming homosexual. Flaming homosexual. You know what I say when I say flaming? You know, like very, ooh, no questions, right? Not trying to keep it a secret. And he says, uh, he says, will you, will you have lunch with me? She says, of course. And he said, uh, he said, you know, I've been watching you, and he says, I think you're a fake. And she said, what do you mean you keep it? He says, I've been watching you, and you, you're too good to be true. Your life is too good. I've seen you on Facebook. I've seen your family. That's, you're a fake. You have to be a fake. Tell me you're a fake. And she goes, well, no, listen, I don't know what his name is. Let's call him Jeff. She said, Jeff. I'm not perfect, I can tell you that. And my family is not perfect. But she said, I'm not fake. She says, I love Jesus. Now this is my daughter who, at 15 years old, went to the restaurant that had just opened up in Finley and said to the manager who had come from Texas, the head honcho, he said, I'll hire you, but you're going to have to work every Sunday. My daughter stood up, clicked her heels together, and said, my father is a pastor, and I don't work on Sundays. <laughs> and he said, well, if you don't work on Sundays, you don't have a job. And she said, well, if you want to lose the best employee that you could have ever had, <laughs> then let me walk out the door. He was so impressed with her that he hired her. She never worked a Sunday during the six years that she worked there, except one Sunday a year. You know what Sunday she worked every year? Nope. Mother's Day. And I said, Mimi, why are you working on Mother's Day? She said, because there's moms there that need a break. And when I show up, I give a mom a break. I said, okay, Miss Church, good day. She said, uh, let me tell you my story. Again, now I'm talking about story. She's talking to Jeff. He said, you're a fake. He said, how did you, how did you come to this faith in Jesus? She said, well, my dad's a pastor. He backs up. He goes, huh? He goes, yeah. He said, my dad was a businessman, and he was very wealthy. And he wouldn't have been very wealthy. He would have retired when he was 50 and played golf in Boca Raton. But he said, God got a hold of my dad, and he quit his job, and he became a pastor. And Jeff looked at her and said, are you kidding me? I've never heard anything like that at all. The conversation ends. She doesn't see Jeff for two years. She's in Las Vegas about three weeks ago. Jeff calls her on the phone and says, Amy, there's an LGBTQ event they're throwing here in Vegas for, you know, the Marriott. He said, I get to invite somebody, and he says, I would like to invite you to come with me. Would you come? Are you thinking what you would answer yet? She said, of course I would come. Why wouldn't I go with you? He said, you know, because I'm gay. She goes, I'm not worried about that. She says, of course, I love you. You're my friend. I'll go with you. So they go to this big splash, which really had nothing to do with LGBTQ. They were just the ones who were paying for it. 
And they ended up at a table by themselves because he guided her to this spot where it was secluded. And then with his tears in his eyes, he said, Amy, tell me the story about your dad again, how he left his business and how he gave his life to serve other people. Tell me that story again. So she did. Here's a man who's lived his entire life, he's so successful that money more than anyone could ever imagine. He lives, been married to this and a partner for about 15, 20 years. He says, Amy, would I be welcome at your dad's church? Now what do you hope? that she would say. You would hope that she wouldn't say, of course not, you're a flaming homosexual, we don't believe in homosexuality, and you're a sinner, and you're going to hell. So no, you would not be welcome at my dad's church. <laughs> or, Jeff, you want to call her dad? Of course you would be welcome at his church. And they would love you. They would care for you. You're not going to teach Sunday school, Jeff. <laughs> but they would love you. He said, I know. But he said, we I can go there. I said, yeah. Now what I want you to hear is <clears throat> that there's a, a compelling part of that story that he saw that was energized his capacity. My granddaughter, a compelling story. My daughter began to have the words to say, Jeff, you'll be welcome. God's got a plan for your life. She says this to him. God's got a plan for your life. My life? Yes. My life. Your life, Jeff. Of course he's going to have to change. But he's not going to change because I tell him to. There's a trans boy that comes to our church. He thinks he's a girl, 21 years old. He's working at a gas station in the market out of the gas station. And he hears me preaching on YouTube. So he comes to church writes me a letter, writes me an email, and he tells me a little about it. He says, would I be welcome? I said, sure. He wants me to be called Ruby. I said, sure, Ruby, you'd be happy to be welcome. He said, I, he said, I was really compelled by your message. I said, well, Ruby, before you come to church, why don't you come in and give me a meal? Come in and have a cup of you. Let's talk. When we talked, what do you think I talked about? Do you think I told him my story? I said, tell me your story. <laughs> tell me your story. And he began to tell me, I said, I began to ask him questions like, and these are the coaching skills that you see up there. I began to ask him questions, where do you see God in your life? I said, how do you see yourself? Do you, do you see yourself as a man or a woman? He says, well, he says, I know I'm a man, but he says, I feel most comfortable when I'm dressed like a girl. I just feel like more like it's more me. And I said, have you ever been a man? He said, no, I never. Every, every trans is different. Every, every story is different. We're all different. Every story is different. You know, that even if you say you're gay, you don't even, there's so many, there's so many layers of gay that you can't even begin to describe them. And so everybody's got their own story about where they're at. And I said, Ruby, tell me who you think you are. You know what he said? He said, I think I'm a child of God. Amen. Now, I'm a pastor, and I don't like this whole trans business at all. I think, like probably most of you, God created them male and female. Right? That's, my, that's, where I, I'm, I, that's what I believe. But you think I'm going to tell him 
those statements that God created you male and female, and so you choose if you want to stay in this church, you choose whether you're a man or a woman. You see, I know I'm telling you, and I'm doing it intentionally, I don't have all the answers. We're going in our church around and around. Should we have statements? Should we have statements? Should we have a bathroom just for <laughs> unidentified? <laughs> don't know what you are. It creates so much confusion. But my point is this is this idea of prophetically declaring to him what God wants to do in his life to the extent that he can receive it transforms him or allows him to receive what God is doing so that his at some point, he's going to say to me, or she's going to say to me, Pastor, what do you think about my transgender? What do you think about me, about me wanting to be a girl? What do you hope that I say to him? I'm going to say to him, because I've already prepared for that conversation. You know what I'm going to say? What do you think God said to you? What do you think God said to you? And if Ruby were to say to me, I think God says it's okay. You know what I'm going to say? Then let's keep walking together. Then let's keep walking together. Because how are you ever going to know what God really wants for your life unless you're in the community of believers? And I can't throw you out because God's doing something in your life. And who gives any one of us the right to declare to somebody you don't belong in the kingdom of God? God judges. God says who belongs, not me. My job is to make an appeal from God to them. And then God says, I'll sort it out. It's like when the disciples came to Jesus and said, what about those guys? And what about those guys? And what about those guys? And what did Jesus do? He said, let me tell you a parable. There's wheat and tares. And the disciples would want to go out and go, hey, let's pull up all the tares. And God says, no, 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 no. I'll harvest everything and I'll make a decision on the end. I'll harvest everything and make the decision at the end. Our job is not to make the judgments about people. Our job is to declare the judgments of God to people. Like the judgments, the prophetic declarations of who he is and the magnificent power of his love to one another. And if the church does that, God will step in, change. I had a gal come, come to the church. She walked in on a Wednesday night. My wife and I were just sitting on the couch while there were other activities. She comes walking in and she says, what's going on? She says, God just drew me to this church. I said, well, what do you want? And she says, well, I'd like to know more about God. I said, well, sit on the couch here with us and we'll start talking. Next thing I know, she's part of the congregation. Next thing I know, people are surrounding me. I had women coming around this girl. She was rough. She was an alcoholic. She was a drug addict. She was just like, you know, where did you come from? That was even before we had recovery. One morning, she's standing in the front. She's standing there with her arms lifted, and they were singing, Behold the Lamb of God. Yeah. She's singing, Behold the Lamb, Behold the Lamb, Behold the Lamb. And she leans over to the lady who's been walking with her and standing with her and she goes, Sherry, who's the lamb? <laughs> and Sherry said, oh, Jesus is the lamb who died for your sin. Washed you white as snow. Giving you a new way. She said, oh, I don't do altar calls because Jesus shows up and reveals himself to people. If I have people who will walk with them. Okay? So now, I want you to think about this. This is how it goes. What do you know for sure God 
is saying. If I were to ask you, give me a statement, a declaration, here's what God is saying. Now, if it helps, maybe you think of someone else. Maybe you can think of another person that you would say it to. A lot of times, and I'm not going to do it here, I don't think. I will have people break up into little groups of two or three, and I'll say, okay, pray with one another for a little bit. And then as you're praying, <clears throat> get settled about what you think God would say to them. Right? You're praying for them, you know a little bit, maybe about the show. Maybe they're going through a hardship. And you would say, okay, here's what God would say to you. Hold on, persevere, or it might be, let go and be free. It may be, you know, whatever it might be, because either one of those God would say. And so when you start thinking about someone else, what would you say that you know right now? You don't have you don't have to pray and go, oh God, what would it be? Nothing like that. You just know it's true. Somebody give me something. What is it? Jesus loves, Jesus loves you. Okay, is that a prophetic statement? Basic, but it's it is. It's true. Yeah. Jesus loves you. Okay, so now, if I were going to coach, I'm going to push. You don't have to respond. I'm going to push for everybody. So if you were in my congregation and I was doing this, and I do this all the time, we'll sit here and I'll go, okay, we're going to make some prophetic statements. I'll say, what do you know about God? And they'll stand and they'll go, God is love. God loves everybody. Okay? And then I'll say, okay, now fine. Now, push back. What do you know more about God loves everybody? He died on a cross. Okay? And now, think about what sins did Jesus die for? Don't answer. Right? And then I keep pushing. Now, if you were talking to someone else, there would be things that you... Okay, let's just... We're going to do it. We're going to do it. I can't, I can't help it. Please play. You okay? Say, look at me and go, Pastor Dutch is the greatest thing that ever happened. Okay, we're going to come. Get one person, just get a partner. Find a person, find a person, just do a real quick. Who will sit next to you, whatever. Get it right now. Who? It's Pentecostal. It's charismatic. You're changing denominations. Who? Look, look at the person next to you. You go, I'm going to pray for you.
What did you guys say? Um, I was saying, she was perfect. Okay, come on, come up here. She is, uh, God said that she is perfect. God said she's perfect. Yes, because we, God created in His image, image according to His yeah. image. That's yeah. why I, I, I look okay, at good. her like... Sit down. You, that was great. That's great. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. How, did, how did you receive them? How did you, how did you receive them? Did it help you? Yes. Okay, hold on. Okay, so now you think, okay, so that's funny that she said you're perfect, right? And you go, oh, yeah, right, nice, try, right? What are you trying to win friends and influence people, right? But did that help this girl? Oh, oh, oh pay attention up here so you'll see what, because I'm coming at you next. Okay, so how did this help, how did that help you? I mean, what, how did that encourage you? Hold on, let me, I'm going to hear you, I want you to hear one of so, Yeah, there you go. When she speaks that, that speaks something to pain, identity, something that has happened in your life that causes you to think maybe you're not perfect. What? Now, now you don't have to tell me, but is that something deep inside of your soul? That hurt? Say it to these people. I want you to stand up and I want you to look at them all. Was that something deep in your soul? You don't have to tell me what it was. I just want you to tell them, yes, it was something deep in my soul that that ministered to. Okay, you know, you're already getting, she's getting tears in her eyes. Aren't you? Are you, are you getting this though? I want you to see this. Look at how much fun we're having and how chaotic this is right now. And this sister, with what she already knows about God, what she already knows about God, says to her friend, God says you're perfect. Yeah. When she said that to us, we all chuckled. But she didn't. She received it. And it ministered something that is deep, probably in your past, something that hurt you. Okay. Did it change her life? Not yet. But if we keep talking, listen to me. If I if I kept going here and there weren't a whole lot of people and we were broadcasting this over the internet. In my church, what I would do is I would say, okay, let's talk about this. How, how comfortable are you talking about your past? How comfortable are you revealing how you were hurt and how this ministry? And then I would say, now, let's pray again. And let's begin to speak words to her from now what we know about her circumstance that God says to her. And then what's going to happen is you're going to begin to speak those words and now they go from, and this is where I'm just saying you have to be willing to go here, maybe not everybody's willing to, but what I push my people to do is I want them to go beyond what they know to what they believe God is saying. It's always aligned with God's spirit and his scripture. Nothing out there. But I want them to say, now this is something that God is revealing to me now that he has said and I'm giving it to you as a gift. And for me, that's what prophetic declaration is all about. And you have to practice it, you have to push it, but you have but but it, it becomes more. It's like any gift, spiritual gift. You get, you get what you know. You have what you have in your pocket. It's like generosity. If you don't use what you have, you never get more. But if you'll spend what you have, if yeah. you'll get what you have, then God will give you more. Amen. And so you open your mouth and you begin to speak to someone and say, here's what God is saying. So if I were to say, I'm just going to, okay, I know you all have done it. 
And so afterwards, you can talk to each other, even maybe push a little bit more, but I know it's awkward in the way that we're doing this, and it's, it's really not a good group, I mean, not an environment for us to practice like this, but, but if, I were to, if I were to see a young girl or a young boy, let's just say this here, this boy, you know, who's, you know, in the middle and walking, okay, no, 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 I'll tell you what this, that happened just while we were here in, uh, we were in Bacola. We were staying at this, the only room we could get in Buffalo for one night was uh, was this water park thing, right? This water park, and so we had to stay there. It was like, we didn't want to, but we had to. And they had this, they had this trans uh, boy there. Uh, his name was uh, uh, Jesse. And Jesse was at the counter, he was selling the, the sodas and the different things, and, and, uh, and he was trans, and everybody knew him from before, and I don't want to overstate that. I don't want to say anybody did it wrong. I just because you know I'm not I'm not the judge of it. But a lot, a lot of times the easy way to come, like you think you're doing ministry when you go up to Jesse and you go, Jesse, you're a boy, not a girl. I'm declaring over you, you're a boy, not a girl. I get it. I get it. I think I don't. I wouldn't do it that way. But but if, but if you know I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. But that's what was happening. People were coming in and saying, Jesse, you're a boy, not a girl. And Jesse just retreats. Look, watch. Here's, you have to be aware of what's going on. So, Jesse, you're a boy, not a girl. And Jesse's like this. Is that ministry? Jesse, you're a boy, not a girl. Or you can say, Jesse. You know what I said to God loves you no matter what you do. Yes. Now, Jesse thought I was coming over like everybody else to say, Jesse, you're a boy, not a girl. And so when I came up to Jesse, I said, Hey, Jesse, good to see you. And he was like, And I said, hey, God loves you, Jesse. Right where you're at. You don't have to do anything, and God still loves you. Where do you think Jesse moves? Close. Every time I walk in and out of the park, I say, hey, Jesse. Remember, God loves you no matter what you've done, where you've been, what your past, what you're in, what you're doing. I say it every Sunday. God loves you. You're welcome here no matter where you've been, what you've done, and what your past. This is the place where God says you can come and find his love and we'll walk with you until you find it. That's prophetic. That's me saying to Vince, Pastor Vince, I see you in the future. The bright future. And you look much better than you look right now. Because God is in you. And I'm declaring that over you so that you can be whole. And then Jesse dies still thinking that he's more comfortable being a boy, I mean a girl, than a boy. Or if my little Ruby dies in a train wreck or a hurricane or a lightning strike before what, you know, she ever gives, you know, like her identity and says, I know who I am. Do you think that God, in His mercy, in His grace, doesn't reach down to that that broken that broken person that says, "I see you, who you are." If we have to be perfect to come into the presence of God, then none of us come. But if we come into the presence of God by the power and the love of Jesus Christ, who know no boundaries, who left no hurt untouched, 
who left no evil unturned over or addressed, who left no need unspoken. Our God, Jesus, who he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, then, I don't know, man, I just, I'm just going to speak up to you. Do people need to change? Yes, they do. You need to speak truth to them. Of course you do. It's cruel not to. But you have to earn the right to speak that kind of truth into someone's life. Right? You can't just come up in the street and go, boom, truth, boom, boom. No, you got to say, hey, listen, let me extend the level back here. Look at Jesus with the woman at the well. Let's talk a little bit. Oh, yeah, and by the way, yeah, I know all about you. I know all about you. You do? Uh-huh. And you're still talking to me. Uh-huh. And you heard Pastor Pete talk about that woman just took off of me. So, uh, we'll talk more. You might have questions about this. We'll bring it back. I'm still looking at the competencies. And uh, Pastor Malaysia, I'm done. I'm good enough. I'll give you an extra talk. Pastor Herat, may kwan ka ng uh, 